thanks. Um, I, I know for sure that uh, I'm standing between drinks and so <laughs> to, believe you me, I'll get through this pretty quick. But uh, look, I'm happy for you to ask questions uh, any time. And yes, I haven't been travelling, it's been really good. But um, I must admit, I spend in recent years a fair bit of time in New York and actually I don't mind that. <laughs> actually, the university there is uh, very welcoming and when they give you an apartment on Central Park, you can't say much else, okay? So, um, anyway, stick at it. It's worth doing. Um, so, look, I'll, um, I've been asked today to talk more around this whole carbon story. You may have touched on it earlier today in various ways, but it is very topical, um, extremely topical. Uh, there's a, we've, got a, we've got a federal government that's very keen on getting industry involved, which is great. Um, we've got a federal government that likes to use numbers from industry, which isn't that great because some of these numbers are maybe a bit out of whack, maybe a bit inflated. But on the other hand, the key message I'm going to take out, I want you to take out of this is carbon in soils is critical for your systems. No matter what, you might not make a buck out of the actual selling your carbon, but tell everyone out there Increase your carbon levels and you'll make a buck more out of a sustainable production system. So I've finished what I came to say. Yeah. <laughs> so you can go to the bar. The, um, look, there are a lot of um, different pathways for greenhouse gas emissions in uh, agriculture. This is a bit of a combination, grazing systems uh, and also uh, cropping systems. We don't grow much rice in Australia, but uh, I don't think this works, but I can walk around. Uh, the key is methane, nitrous oxide, and I'll explain that a bit more. But it's a pretty complex environment, as you can see. This guy, girl, is actually a pretty uh, major contributor. But uh, soil carbon, this, this cycling of carbon uh, is critical. But a bit, of a bit of an issue here, as we know, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, my interest in, in a lot of this is soils and nitrous oxide, because nitrous oxide comes from manures as well. It comes from um, fertilisers, and uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, potent greenhouse gas as well. Now, the other one might be better. Just to get some of these uh, definitions in place, what's carbon farming? Um, you want to increase management practices that increase carbon in the landscape. I've said carbon, that could, that could be soil carbon or tree carbon, plants, uh, sorry, something that's going to stay there permanently. You want it there permanently because as soon as you start knocking it down, you're in trouble. So uh, I won't talk about trees today. I'm going to talk more about soils. And uh, we want to minimise these non-CO2 emissions whilst improving the uh, productivity, sustainability and resilience. The core part of this is, which was really good, um, the previous, previous government came in, I'm, I'm trying to be non-partisan, believe you me, but what I'm saying is the previous government spent a lot of money on this carbon, carbon farming initiative, but the key to it was productivity. You're not going to do something without being productive. And that's the core, that is the key. I mean, I, my, the work I do is applied. We understand the processes, we look into the processes, but you, the grazier is the, is the is, that's where the buck stops and they're the ones you've got to, you've got to help. So um, we'll talk about non-CO2 emissions. There's uh, a term called ACU, Australian Carbon Credit Unit, and that's what the government will buy or, or credit you with. It's worth about $20 at the moment from the government uh, they have a reverse auction, so they take the cheapest, but everyone wins a prize normally because they really are keen to get hold of them. And uh, that ACU is being traded internally now around Australia closer to $40. So uh, it's probably worth looking at. So a soil carbon, as I said, I'm talking about soil carbon, and uh, because that's the word on everyone's <laughs> lips at the moment. Uh, we want to talk about a soil carbon credit or debit. And you need to look at the change with respect to the practice, and then you need to subtract any 
non-CO2 emissions, okay? So it's not just a matter of carbon changing. You don't get paid on that alone. You have any non-CO2 emissions, that has to be debited, and they can be significant, as I'll show you from animal systems. Uh, why? Look, methane and nitrous oxide aren't em emitted to the extent CO2 was being exchanged, but they have this... Um, the term is global warming potential. So methane has a higher impact on the atmosphere than CO2, 28 times more. Nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, so if you go to the dentist, he's leaking a bit out sometimes, um, that's, that has a global warming potential 265 times. And these numbers change a little bit depending on... Uh, on what some of these government agencies are, are playing with in terms of calculations, that can be 300 sometimes. So you can see that little bit of gas, nitrous oxide, has a big impact on the atmosphere compared to CO2. So we've got to take all that into account. So when you hear um, in the media or read about Australia's greenhouse gas budget, or it's normally talking about this term here called CO2 equivalent which is, that's how you calculate it out. That's your carbon change, carbon C. Multiply that by 3.7, gives you CO2. And then you've got to add your methane, gas, multiply that by 28, and then your nitrous oxide, and multiply that by 265. There's your common currency. That's the currency the world over, CO2 equivalents. So, um, if you're talking to someone and they say CO2, you say CO2 equivalents, and then I'll think, okay, I know what you're talking about. But um, what is coming through the legislation now is this carbon credit, they call it a methodology. It's a very complex methodology, even to get it to, to make that to make that buck, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops in terms of calculations. And um, that's that's literally going into legislation early next year. So, I press the right button. What is soil organic carbon? Um, people talk about organic matter. What's organic matter? You and I are organic matter. We're organic. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, we're everything. We've got all these other... Some people have arsenic with them, but they don't last too long. But um, carbon is part of that. So, carbon is about 58% of soil organic matter. And when you send a soil off to get it sampled, uh, analysed, they'll come back with the carbon content, the nitrogen content, the phosphorus content. How much carbon is in a soil? Probably, it's, it doesn't sound like much, it can range from 1% to 8%. So what's that? Uh, let's say 1%. That's 0 0.01 of a gram per gram of soil. And I've just tried to give an illustration of what I mean. Most of it is this material where the phosphorus and nitrogen and all that is, is coupled to. But carbon's just this small chunk scattered all through it. And then, it's, you can, this, it's not, uh, what do they say? So, oils ain't oils? Well, soils ain't soils. Because you've got all these, you've got this material, think about it, if you're adding wood all the time, and that's got lignin in it, and that takes a fair while to degrade. So that, that contributes to the stable organic carbon. Then you have the bugs doing all the work, just like you and I. We take in food, expel CO2, they're doing the same thing, and anything um, refuse ends up in these different uh, labile pools and stable pools. That, that, it, the, the lines here are blurred. They're not exact but they're blurred. But all I'm trying to say here is that um, carbon, there's a whole lot of different forms of chemicals in that carbon. So when you get that number, one number, it's got stable organic carbon, labile organic carbon, which is easily decomposable, like a carbohydrate, and then but you've got the bugs working on it. And the bugs are about 5% of that pool. Okay, so that's, that's when people talk about soil carbon, they're talking about organic carbon. They're not talking about inorganic. Inorganic carbon 
is what you see in a soil which has got a high pH. It's called carbonate. Okay? You don't count that. It's organic carbon when it comes to Mr. Morrison paying you some dollars. Or, um, as I said, sustainable agriculture is about carbon. Loss of carbon. Now, this is a cropping picture, but this is the Mallee. I don't know if you've been to the Mallee, but there's a lot of desert-like... Uh, it's, it's a desert-like environment in um, western, northwestern Victoria. And they crop this, and you can see when they started back here in the 1900s, early, late 1800s, and then they've cropped it, and you can see it's, they've lost all its carbon, they've cultivated, the carbon's gone, the bulk density holding it together has fallen out, it's degraded, it's, it's decomposed, it's become CO2, and you can see how much there's been a decline just in the... It's not erosion, that's just the whole decline in the carbon being removed from the system. And there's not a lot of carbon in there in the first place because these are sands. So it's a pretty inhospitable, inhospitable environment. Um, only yields about two tonnes of uh, grain if you're lucky. But that's... What, what, is, what does that mean? It means something like this. When it rains, that's what you get. You don't have the bulk density there. You don't have the structure. The water sits on the top. That's a sandy soil I showed before. It would drain. That's in the Wimmera, not far from there, a few hundred kilometres. Again, these two paddocks are across the fence line from each other. This guy cultivated and did not use sort of conservation agricultural practices. This carbon's gone. Bulk density has increased, which is bad. The water is sitting there. Where's his crop? Gone. This guy here has... Um, obviously conservation ag, retained residues. So the pra the, all I'm trying to say here is that's, this is just a picture tells a thousand words. That's what carbon does. Okay? Um, but there's no magic number for carbon. I can't say you must have 2% carbon to be sustainable. The key is increasing from where you are. If you go down, you're going in the wrong di direction. When this was taken, we would, people were asking that question. What's the threshold? Where, where do I start? What's the magic number? There's no magic number. It means just going up. So, the, um, I'm keeping on the time, don't worry. The, um, well and truly. So, restoring carbon. How do you do it? So, this is more cropping relevant, but again, it's just an example. So, I've spoken about the different fractions in soil, okay? This, uh, this resistant fraction that's been there a long time, you've got this, and that doesn't change. That's like where you've had fire go through or something like that. It's resistant, it's charcoal. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't change. Then you've got this more uh, stable fraction, which can change a little bit. And then you've got this labile fraction, particulate matter, which changes even more. But over time, this is what happened. People came along, cleared, um, and, for example, look at Brigolo. My PhD, a long time ago, as you can see, was in the Brigolo when they, when they cleared it. And what actually happened to the uh, nitrogen status of the Brigolo? And that's what happened. It went down, and then we wanted to come back. How do we do it? The best way to do it is converting to pasture. So if people do want to make a buck, and, you, and you're talking to any croppers, and they say, I don't care what I do now, I want, to I want to make a buck out of carbon, tell them to do this, move over to livestock. And, um, but what you need, this is the take-home message here, carbon needs carbon. How are you going to grow it? How do you get bigger? You've got to put carbon in. So you've got carbon needs carbon. It's climate dependent. If you've got a drought, you're in big trouble because the biomass, the carbon, has to grow you've got a drought, it's not going to grow. You, nothing's there. You need nitrogen and phosphorus inputs because you need a balanced system. And number one key, clay soils. You've got to be on a clay. If you're on a sand, go to the beach. That's what you have to do. <laughs> Call it a beach. A clay soil, you must have a significant amount of clay. When I say significant amount, you're looking at like the vertisols 
around the Mitchell grass, things like that. You're looking at about 50% clay to have an impact. But again, the way we look at this, from real information, and I'll show you some in a minute, small changes in carbon over large areas will add up, so you might make a buck out of it. So here's just an example of drought. You've seen all this. This is up around Crow's Nest, and I think the politicians think it's like this every year. I know the politicians, I, I worked a lot with state government, not with Haley that much, but other people in state government who higher up the food chain who weren't in agriculture, and what they say is, um, it'll rain one day. It does, we know. But it's when it's not raining, is when that happens, and there's no carbon, that's when the systems fall apart. So, um, that's a great picture, but the politicians think it's just like that. And now, we know what it's really like. Now, to give you an idea of some real numbers, and this is what I mentioned before, um, there's a lot there. I'll try and just briefly summarise. You don't store a lot of carbon in pasture systems uh, once you're away from the coast, OK? Um, look, we're looking at half a tonne to a tonne, if you're lucky, of carbon being stored under new practices. So here we've got grazing management, crop to pasture, legumes. And I must admit, I suppose, this is the where, I, where I'm sort of working in at the moment because um, some of the funding we have, I'm not working on Lukina exactly, I'm working on Desmanthus uh, because one, you don't need fertiliser. Fertiliser goes up into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. Desmanthus is a legume which can potentially help reduce methane, which is great from animals. And thirdly, legumes will actually provide more biomass back into the soil. So I suppose this is the area I have some uh, affinity to at the moment. Grazing management, uh, been there, done that. I, look, there's a lot of work going on at the moment around Australia on, gra on cell grazing. Um, oh, look, the, I'm being careful here. <laughs> okay? Um, I... I think when the numbers come in, you'll find that's a correct number, okay? Uh, I'm not, I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong for all the people who go down this route, but just be careful. There's not enough information out there. And that's all we're saying to people. Let's get some more information. Let's get real information. I, I am, it is disappointing that there's a lot of um, industry out there who aren't actually providing peer-reviewed science. Okay, peer reviewed, which means it's, it's got the scrutiny, it's, it's valid as far as the science of it is global. Um, love to see more data on cell grazing. We've got projects on cell grazing and we're really interested in it, but I think it, from a purely a um, sustainable ag point of view, I think it's great. I don't think there's a buck in it from a um, carbon credit point of view. So, um, I don't know where this tape video goes, whether I get run over as I go outside, but um, the, pe the people, uh, pe people know what my opinion is. I, I, I'm very, I, I think I'm objective in that. There's the numbers. Uh, they stand up in court, okay? If they don't, if they don't like that, they don't like it. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, as I said before, that number, that threshold for soil carbon, there's no magic number. One single number is misleading. You need to know the dynamics, whether it's going up or down. Here's a good example. This side of the fence has been flogged. We know that for a fact. This side of the fence has been, um, there's been rotational grazing in it, um, spelling, everything, but the carbon levels in the surface are both are very different, four tonnes. Now, this one's actually increasing a bit, we know. The other thing to look at is this number. 20 plus one, plus or minus one, 16 plus or minus three. And you think, well, you guys are pretty lousy, you've got this big error, what have you done? It's not, it's called variability in the landscape. It's like anyone's yard or anything. 
Um, there's not a constant number across If you look at a landscape, you, um, it, it's highly variable. And I'll show you some pictures, which you would have seen many times, but I'll show you some more in a minute. But whilst that's above ground, and again, can't tell, a, that picture tells a thousand, tells, picture is a thousand words, but on the other hand, that's a bit misleading, that one. The key's below ground. Yes? Oh, just a quick question. Like, do you know that that country on the left has been religiously flogged or has it just been worn in and then flogged? And that's why I it's think it's been it? religiously yeah. flogged. Yeah. Um, the, the, these numbers, those numbers are actually from a farm that my off-site, my 2IC, uh, he, he owns the farm up around Crow's Nest. So he knows it pretty well. I was just okay, so I didn't make that one up. Okay. <laughs> for, for convenience. Um, but the key's below ground. You don't see what's going on below ground, but this is the key. Look at that. Deep-rooted crops and, and pastures. That's what soil organic carbon, that's where it starts from. It's all this material here. This is all eaten, as we know, all grazed down. Here's what's left. And if you can stimulate that below ground by your grazing uh, pressure, uh, your stocking rates changing, yeah, great. But... Um, Adding chemicals and saying I'm going to have more bugs there if I add this and that. Look, I'm sorry. I think that's I think that's a bit of um, I'm a micro, I'm, I'm actually a soil microbiologist by training. Okay, um, adding some glucose and that will give you a burst for about four days. No, not even that. And then the bugs are gone again. They die. So be careful. This is what's going on below ground. Okay, it's not a pasture, but there it is, a tree or crop or whatever. You've got bugs, you've got these stable material. They're chewing on it. There's some more there. This is a, as I said, the stable material is like, that's a benzene ring, which means it's hard to degrade. You want, you want it there. You don't want all your carbon to be in this simpler form. You want some solid uh, carbon there in terms of keeping the bulk density. But... That's what's happening below ground. These bugs, you want to feed the bugs, keep this label on material, have something in them, and it's the roots. It's the below ground activity which is critical. <laughs> now, I, t I spoke about, I spoke already about variability. This is a site in uh, southern Queensland. And the colours mean, as you can see there, north to 30 centimetres total carbon. Look at the range. Okay, ranges from 20.9 down to about, there's a little bit of a orange there, 33, 36. That's 500 metres, 500 metres. Okay, 25, what's that, 25 hectares or something, I don't know. The, uh, off the top of my head, there. Yeah. The, um, but you can see there how much variability there is. So, if you want to get it, if you want to get the right number and reduce your uncertainty, to make a buck out of carbon, you've got to get this uncertainty, you've got to get these numbers down pretty tight. You've got to get that error bar down pretty tight, so then if you do impose a practice and increase your carbon, it's measurable, it's significant, okay? So, that's, uh, that's the fields there. I mean, obviously, I mean, you would have seen plenty of these. That's, that's what we're looking at, our variable. There's melon holes here and everything. But, uh, so, again, there's a fair bit of material there. You can read through that. Uh, you have high sampling cost to overcome this spatial, error, uh, spatial uh, variability. Uh, but again, we've got two sites. This is one site, another site. Okay, and you can just see, look at the variability, 0 to 10, 20, 30, of course, we, we do know as you go down the profile, your carbon levels drop off. But look at the variability in those soils just in the top 10 centimetres, 20, 30, okay? This is not one-off. This is what life is about, okay, out um, in, any, in any field. And if I come in and put all these numbers together, site one, site two, um, you can see here, there's my mean here, my mean here, but look at the variability. This site 
was supposedly um, under cell grazing for 15 years. This was under for five years. Okay? Now, I'm not saying it's not the right way to go. All I'm saying is, in this case, we weren't able to detect any difference. Uh, it's a clay soil, but on the other hand, a grey clay and uh, highly variable. I mean, that's just that landscape, okay? But it's pretty common. So, one way to get around this, and I'll just talk about it very quickly, is, so that's under prolonged cell grazing, that's under a shorter period, just gone in. So, we use these things that look like a souped up weather station. And instead of going around taking soil samples everywhere, this is actually measuring the amount of carbon dioxide being exchanged between the plant and the soil and the atmosphere. And then we're able to then pull that apart with some models and um, come up with things like this. This is what's happened. So, here's your timeline. Here is, this means net ecosystem exchange. In one, well, what it means is, the more negative you go, the more carbon you are bringing into the system. Okay? The more negative, that's all that means. So, 15 years cell grazing. Wow, we didn't measure it with soil carbon change, but we certainly saw a difference of more carbon in the system using the flux systems, we call them. This is a five year. In transition, this is a 15 year. So, if I've gone out to make a buck out of carbon, I haven't got it from here, I haven't proved it here at all, but I've proven it here. So I'm just saying, there are other techniques on the horizon where people might be able to do this. But these things, this looks like the Mars rover or something, these things aren't something you'll buy and, and roll out in your own yard. They're 60K equal, but yeah, 60K. That's not what a graze is going to buy. Anyone will. So the way we're using these is, uh, MLA have funded some, and actually MLA have funded quite a few. We're actually using them at uh, core sites. So to give us the base information to put into some uh, calculators. So if, if, if a property wants one, go right ahead. But what we're banking on is the fact um, we can get enough information, putting these in core areas around Queensland, and we can then provide calculation uh, based on a very uh, well calibrated model. Now, sorry, just before you go on, yeah. I'm fascinated by the interaction with rainfall. So, yep, that's exactly. 1920, you had, you can see that there's been a response from the rainfall, but then there's been a large event in yep. December 20, and it's continued to decline. So is that because the carbon storage is in You get a bit of a, uh, well, after a rainfall event, uh, event things Pick up, pick up well yeah. and truly. And in this case, you've got more plant growth. Where's that plant growth? What's it mean? More carbon. So the carbon's been taken up, and this means the carbon's gone into the system. Gotcha. Okay, so a lot of carbon's gone. So here, not much rain, but you've got to see, here's another one. See the rainfall event? There's been an uptake of carbon. Gotcha. Okay, and then drought like conditions. What have we got? Rainfall over here, a few blips, 20 mils, whatever. And then, bang, carbon's taken up, okay? So then we can pull, so this signal that we call, we then pull that apart into two parts. One is soil carbon and one is plant carbon. So the okay. rainfall sped up the process. Rainfall, It's, still, it's yep. still increasing its carbon storage. Yeah, but, but rainfall speeds up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, oh, there's another one down here, you can see. This here, what happened here could have been... Um, it could have been, I can't, a drying event or whatever, but again, uh, you can see how it's sped up. I'm just going to change uh, gear for a sec. Again, um, I'll, just, I'll just go back. Look at these numbers again, just so I remind you. Half a tonne, one tonne, okay? One tonne of carbon per hectare, okay? Let's see our friendly methane emissions. What are they? So, per annum, it says there are 110 kilos of methane is produced annually by one dairy cow, two beef steers, okay? 
So that's about 55 kilograms a prox. What's 55 kilograms equal to? 1.5 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. What happened to your, which is 0.45 tonnes of carbon? What did I say before? Good practice, you might store half a tonne, you might store a tonne. One steer will blow that away. Literally. Okay? So, that's, I didn't mean that, I just, I just thought, I, I'll remember that one. Okay, so that's, um, so that's why methane is such a, a big, the big bad man on the, on, on the horizon. Not on the horizon, we know it's there. So, um, how do we reduce methane? I'm not an animal physiologist, I work closely with a, the, a guy who's doing um, these talks in Southern Australia called Richard Eckhart, who's more of an animal, animal physiologist. That's his background, methane. So I've just taken some of his information, which I know, because um, better management, finishing quicker. Think, think about it, if you, get, if you can get it off the paddock quicker, then it's not emitting methane. So that's one way to reduce your methane budget, methane signal. Legumes, more nitrogen, better feed quality, you get them off quicker as well, it reduces your methane signal. Supplements, oils, tannins, so there's interaction with the rumen, better breeding, but that 1% per year is breeding slow. Breeding's a slow process. Wearable device, I should have put the picture there. They actually have these devices that you put on, like, what's his name? Um, Anthony Per uh, Hopkins, okay? <laughs> they literally have devices, I've got a picture. Um, and what it does, it, it, uh, it's a chemical reaction. So as they emit the methane, it becomes oxidised to CO2, okay? And it's quite, quite effective, but I don't think you're going to have much... Uh, I, don't, I can't see how it's going to be practical, okay? Anyway, lots of impractical things. And then there are the vaccines. You've heard about vaccines. They've been around... That push has been around a long time. Inhibitors, seaweed and 3 knot. Um, from what I'm hearing, seaweed... Yeah, 3 knot, yes. Seaweed could be toxic in high in, in high amounts. So that's, that's sort of what I'm hearing. But it, it may be... It may be a ridiculous amount, I don't know. But this isn't my game, I'm sorry. Um, just to give you another quick slide. Live weight versus a, uh, age and days. And here's uh, leukina versus road grass. And you can see clearly that the live weight gained better up with leukina. And then we flip over here, same thing, methane, you have the leukina, in terms of methane, leukina is lower. Okay, so I work mostly in nitrous oxide now. Um, my group does the official emission, they call the emission factors for nitrous oxide. So urine hits the ground, emits nitrous oxide. Fertiliser breaks down, emits nitrous oxide. It's not a big number. It's only about 1% or even less of the amount of N. But um, it is an important number, mainly in cropping systems. But here, we don't have, num we don't have many numbers at all for grazing land, for grasslands. We have, I'll call, I'll call them grasslands, because we work a lot with groups in the US. Um, rangelands, grasslands, whatever you want to call them. And uh, well, most of our data has been cropping. But here, it basically says... Look, urine N is mainly urea, we know that. Less than 30% is utilised for production, the rest is lost. Where's it go? Okay, out the back, and then nitrous oxide is produced. But nitrous oxide is produced in much lower quantities when you talk about CO2 equivalents compared to methane. Okay? But, but, these numbers are pretty dodgy at the moment. We need more information, but it won't be anywhere near what methane's doing. But again, that's just one, one steer as well. So go back to that soil carbon number I gave you and it uh, gets wiped out pretty quickly. Options to reduce nitrous oxide, legumes are good. Uh, same thing, tannins, protein complex. 
deep-rooted uh, Brocaria species are, they emit, not emit, they, uh, emit's not the word, sorry, they uh, exude um, a chemical called a biological nit nitrification inhibitor. What does that mean? It just slows the whole process down. And here's just a graphic. There's the amount of nitrous oxide emitted, metres squared per year, and there's some different... There's, there's your brack area down here, soybean, conventional, I don't know what was growing there, probably a crop or something. But you can see here um, these uh, brachiaria species um, are useful. We do have some greenhouse gas calculators. Um, this is one, there's a yeah, website there you can see. This is pretty, um, that's been there a while. That's pretty rough calc, but it's all based on the inventory, what the government has. We, we contribute to that. Uh, it, it'll, it, it'll give you the ballpark, okay? And that's for a farming enterprise, so it includes crops and, um, and animals, but we, we probably would up, will update that. What you do is you just click on one of these squares, or and that gives you a region, which is uh, the, all your climate information is automatically put in there. It takes two seconds. Now, I wasn't sure whether I'd show this, but all I'm trying to do, and this is all I'm saying, um, get the evidence. And someone getting up saying, Joe Bloggs did this, isn't the evidence. Okay, you want to see it peer reviewed. You want to see the real deal. So this is my summary. If you're going into the carbon credit market, you've got to take into account all the sinks. Sinks means um, what's been sequestered, stored, and the sources which you have to debit. So you've got to take all these into account. Soil carbon is highly variable in a single field, not permanent. Why isn't it permanent? And permanence is one of the things on your contract. You've got to keep the carbon for 25 years. You'll get paid on it. If you do sequester some, they'll pay you. But if it goes down, they're not asking for you to pay. They're not asking for you to pay that back. That's the weird thing, but anyway, it might come back up. But it's not permanent. It's already it's dynamic. It bubbles up and down. In turn, non-CO2 emissions are permanent. Why did I say they're permanent? Because once it's emitted, the gas is gone. Simple as that. It's gone. But for, but for soil carbon, it's below our feet and it's, it's cycling. So it's dynamic. That's the take-home message. That's, that's it. That's all, as I said at the very start. And again, beware of imitations. Okay? Um, it, the only reason I say that, I just, I, I just don't want to see people get burned. Because one of the things about doing soil sampling, it costs a hell of a lot of money. And then in the end, but some companies are coming in saying, we'll do the soil sampling and We'll take the we'll take the um, we'll take the cost. They'll do it. Good luck. Okay. So I think that's it. Haley, you got a question? Can I just build on that figure? Yep. One of the benefits of, of starting this network is that we're hearing producers' experiences who have already signed up to carbon projects. Um, and I think I went into this a little naively, thinking that you know these companies, these agri and they're not all bad, but there are instances where this is happening. Um, thinking that, you know, they had an invested interest too for these projects to pay off for the carbon to be sequestered at the levels that they were suggesting. But I now realise that that's not necessarily the case. These people do have an agenda to develop portfolios that they can on sell. So not all of them are necessarily needing to be there when the chickens are supposed to come home, but the producers will be. So yeah, just yeah that's that you're mind. exactly right. A portfolio they can on sell, so they don't have they've got it off their hands. Yeah. Some um, of the values that are being quoted. Yeah. Are really so quite if, you, if you think I'm outspoken, Richard Eckhart should have been here. I mean, and uh, and Richard and I both work for the don't work, but we do a lot of work for the government sectors, um, federal government, 
and uh, we still do. We haven't been poo-pooed or anything. Um, we lead projects for them. But um, if you want to listen, there's a um, last weekend, uh, Backgrounder it's called, ABC, um, a guy called Jeff Thompson did something on carbon farming. Um, I've had, I had something to say there. There's other aspects of carbon farming, tree, reveg and that. He just, he just basically said at the start when he came to me, I said, look, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too vocal. He said, we just, there's a lot of not naivety out there. Just tell us the truth. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. Just tell us what you know, okay? Uh, I think it's the truth, okay? I firmly believe it's the truth. Okay, so uh, that's it. You can go, go to the bar. You can go to it. <laughs> no, no. Well, I thought you'd be running out the door or something. Yeah. Um, any more questions for Peter? Yeah. Um, so take a long view on, on, on this carbon space. Like, um, you know, say 20 years or something. How do you envisage our agriculture sort of looking in that time? Like, Particularly around that, like you, you talk about sort of converting those sort of those clay type soils into like you know pastures, grazing, etc. They tend to also be the exact same soils that, that produce really good, you know, vegetables, yeah, horticulture. Sure. You know, and there's you know we can't all just be running around eating meat all the time. Yeah. Um, what what do you think well, it's going that? to look? Like? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think it's going to look like in twenty years' time yeah. for oh. for a lot of those sort of regions? You know, think of your you, the Darling Downs group. Maybe I should go back 20 years and tell you what I was thinking then and what it's now. That's the, that's the sort of thing. And I'll go ahead then. 20 years ago, um, there was no money, I don't think, in, in livestock. So it depends. I don't know. I can't tell you the exact time. But it's, it really depends on the economics of these things too. What's the, what's the triple bottom line? Economics, social, environmental. And you've got to put the three together somehow. In 20 years' time, what do I think? I think people are much more tuned on now to sustainable. But for some reason, there's all these different names, region, blah, 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 blah. It's sustainable agriculture. It's been around a long time. We've shifted a lot in terms of, hey, I don't go out and recreational plough when I've got nothing to do on a weekend. <laughs> okay? Um, in the US, yes, I've spent a lot of time working in the US. And these guys got nothing to do in Michigan on a weekend. Go down, have breakfast with the boys and their bib and brace, and then take the plough out for a while, for a run. We're past that. I think Australia's got some really great farmers. We live in a, a, a semi-arid climate and, and variability. This is what is staring everyone in the face, and they're just saying, no, soil carbon's the answer, we're going to make money. Okay, so just beware, just beware of the climate. Clim what's climate change mean? 20 years from now, it will be hotter, it will be warmer, it will be uh, potentially drier, wetter in some places. That's the other thing about climate change. It'll be, co it'll be colder in some places around the world, but it'll be, it looks pretty damn good, it'll be hot here. <laughs> and it's carbon degrades quicker when it's hot. Um, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts in terms of like the industry is going for carbon neutrality. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, if we have producers that are creating actives and selling them off, they, we can't double count, so they go out of the system. Yeah. And we heard today about the tail enders, and we're going to have to somehow make up for those yeah. tail enders with our top producers. And if we're selling credits, and then, you know, how is it that we're going to be neutral if all of a sudden... You know, we've credits got, are sold. And we've got farmers in the negative that aren't improving their practices. Oh, oh look, um, I know there's a few, I don't know what the word to use. Uh, I try and avoid any of these discussions because I'm not an expert in that area, okay? But um, what, what do I, this is why the discussions around making methane lower in terms of its global warming potential, and yes, it has a shorter life in the atmosphere, and it's, and it's valid in a lot of ways. So I think things will change in terms of, um, in terms of methane, will, how, how it will be counted. I think there'll, be, there'll have to be a change. But in terms of what people are doing at the moment, who are the tail enders, I'm hearing, I'm hearing that there's a lot of people just buying credits offshore mm -hmm. uh, from India and China. Like 
uh, trees that are being grown in India at a very low price and saying, I'll offset my emissions. Okay? Look, it's a really complex... Just reading the jargon, I mean, people ask me about this, the conference of parties and all that blight. I mean, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. And I've worked in that, I haven't worked directly there, but I've worked at a high level in the um, World Bank, not suit and tie stuff, out in the field. But this is it, it's, it, it's all, it's just, they make it complex. I'm sorry, that's, I'm, it's a pretty wishy-washy answer, but uh, I, um, I think um, it's going to be a hard slog unless there is a change of the accounting principles for livestock. I mean, I've got great mates of mine who are in my, in my uh, field, who've been taken up by companies to do carbon modelling and all this. And, like, and these voluntary markets are opening up everywhere. The California market. Um, and they're even thinking about coming to Australia. Okay? So if I buy money on the voluntary market, what does that mean? What's the, that's, that's taken out of the system for Australia. What's the politics behind it? So it, 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 is, a really, it, is, a, it is a really tough um, ask. And I don't think these guys really know what they're... When I say these guys, I mean the current government. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'm getting the sense, if I've listened intently and written my notes diligently, that we shouldn't be reliant on soil carbon yep. for sequestration or anything No, like I don't that. think you should be. So, I'm glad I got that right. Yep. So what's the answer then? <laughs> so I only came for 45 minutes to talk about it. Uh, what's the answer? Well, in terms of offsetting emissions, um, honestly, I, I suppose I try to avoid giving you an alternative. What I said was soil carbon is critical for production and, and, and the dollar and the long, the long haul. Okay, yeah. I think that's what you should be telling people. Yeah. And then, if they do, if for some reason you'll get a spike somewhere where farmer, farmer X has made can can account for it, we makes a buck at the same time. But the core of it is to have productive soils that have, you'll make ten times more money than carbon. Okay, right. yeah, that's that's my yeah. take, as I said, take my <clears throat> message. Um.